So before we bring Station Eleven's section that's titled I Prefer You with a Crown into conversation with James Blaylock's short story War of the Worlds, I want to review the concept from Abrams and Harpham's definition of a novel in their glossary of literary terms where they say that the magnitude of the novel distinguishes it from the short story by a greater variety of of characters, a greater variety of characters. We have more room in the novel for points of view, or as we've been calling it, focalization. In a short story, you usually have one character focalizing the action. And each section of Station Eleven to some degree, almost acts like a short story, although they're a bit longer than the, than most short stories are. Um, but Jeevan Chaudhry is our focalizer for the theater. And Kirsten is the focalizer for A Midsummer Night's Dream. So those two sections of the novel are focalized through one character. And incidentally, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of, uh, not a rule, but a, a, a guideline that um, many creative writers use uh, where they say that you should really only use one perspective at a time. If they're jumping around, if, if, a, if a writer jumps perspectives within a single section of a text, um, it's usually an indication that they don't know what they're doing because we, as people, want to stay with a particular point of view. A sustained point of view is going to be more um, satisfying, more familiar for us. Uh, but with a novel, you have so much room that it's okay to switch, say, chapter to chapter, sometimes section to section, even within a chapter where you get those cha those breaks where it's like, you know, you get a white space and then we know we've moved on in some respect. You can move around in that way, but if within one scene you're jumping from perspectives, it can be uh, difficult for the reader. So we usually focalize through a single individual, but over the course of a novel can s focalize through many individuals. And Emily St. John Mandel is not only um, jumping from focalizer to focalizer, but she's jumping from timeline to timeline, right? Jeevan Chaudhry's timeline is right at the moment of the apocalypse. Uh, Kirsten, the Kirsten that we get focalization through, is post-apocalyptic. And at this point, we go pre-apocalypse. I Prefer You with a Crown looks into the, the life of Arthur Leander and allows the action to be focalized uh, through him. And incidentally, he, uh, it report, it, it, he is reportedly going to be played by Gael Garcia Bernal in the upcoming HBO Max um, series of Station Eleven. Um, and, but then it's not just Arthur Leander that, that focalizes the action for I Prefer You with a Crown, because there's a shifting point. There's a point at which uh, it shifts. And this is different from what I was just talking about, because we get Arthur as a sustained focalizer for quite a while before switching to Miranda. And Miranda is going to be played in the HBO series by Danielle Deadweiler. So um, just using these, if you're watching this on YouTube, you, uh, you, you know already, <laughs> using these as images, just as placeholders so that we uh, can, can see those things as concepts. Um, I Prefer You with a Crown has two uh, foci. Uh, foci is the fancy word for focus, right? So instead of saying focus, uh, we say foci. Um, and this is where we get into the other aspect of uh, Abrams and Harpham's definition of the novel, where they say it's not just a greater variety of characters, but a more sustained exploration of character and motives. More sustained exploration of character and motives in a novel. And again, I'm just going to jump very quickly back to something I've said in previous lectures, where I think that movies are closer to short stories, and it's why... Um, a movie has to focus on really one of these features of the novel, one or two, right? Uh, so the features of the novel, greater variety of characters, a greater complication of plot, ampler development of milieu, the, the world that they're living in, and a more sustained exploration of character and motives. And so if a film has a greater variety of characters and a greater complication of plot, it's unlikely that we're going to get a sustained exploration of character and motives. TV series, on the other hand, can do these things. Um, but uh, I Prefer You With a Crown has these two foci. Instances of, of everyday apocalypse 
and intertextuality with comic books. I mean, there's other things that the that this section of the book uh, looks at, but these are the things that I would like to focus on. So the instances of everyday apocalypse are related to the moments of heartbreak that we find in this section of the book where Miranda is moving through um, partners, romantic partners. Uh, you might remember from the uh, the back of the book that uh, we had this one the, we have this one blurb from Emma Straub, author of The Vacationers, where she says Station Eleven is the kind of book that speaks to dozens of the readers in me, the Hollywood devotee, the comic book fan. She talks about the love lover, and those are the three that we get in this section of the book. We're getting the Hollywood devotee, the comic book fan, and the love lover. Whereas in Midsummer Night's Dream, we got some of the other uh, instances that Straub talks about, the cult junkie. And when we say cult junkie, we're not talking about Lovecraftian cults or something like that. It's not a Cthulhu cult. Uh, we're looking at, you know, uh, Jonestown uh, type cults. So we've got that cult leader in the figure of the prophet in Midsummer Night's Dream. But I prefer you with a crown is the moment where we get to the love lover. And the Hollywood devotee, what do we mean by Hollywood devotee? A person who's big into the tabloids, someone who loves to know what's going on with the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Um, and we get that as well in this section. And they're all wrapped up in the everyday apocalypse. And then we get the comic book fan, and there's this intertextuality with Calvin and Hobbes direct intertextuality, announced intertextuality with Calvin and Hobbes, more broadly with the idea of comic books as an art form. And Emily St. John Mandel is having a conversation with that in Miranda's construction of uh, her own comic book, which is where we get the title of the novel, Station Eleven. It's the title of um, Miranda's comic book. And if you got the UK edition of Station Eleven, then you may have the tip-in plate that they developed for that, which was uh, two pages, two imaginary pages from um, from Miranda's book. It's always interesting to me when we get uh, imaginary or fictional texts within fictional texts. That's, uh, that's a whole area of study unto itself. Station Eleven, as a world within a world, a fiction within a fiction, has this gigantic space station, which the novel describes as being uh, the size of a moon and shaped like a planet. And it reminds me in some ways of the gigantic space station from the movie Elysium. We're looking at something on a vast scale, just absolutely massive. But the question that I want us to start considering is why does Emily St. John Mandel choose that as the title if indeed she did choose it because quite often the title of a novel is not always up to the author um, but certainly the, the, that's part of her novel and don't just grab a name out of the air um, why do you think they went with Station Eleven for the title of the book. Why does that tie it together? Or does it just sound, you know, is it, is it a marketing ploy? Do you think it's just a marketing ploy? Um, so to understand instances of everyday apocalypse, I want us to, to move away from Station Eleven for a moment to use James Blaylock's, James P. Blaylock's uh, War of the Worlds, which is making a direct reference to H.G. Wells's uh, seminal alien invasion story the war of the worlds by hg wells was the first alien invasion story of note there was like one or two apparently prior but nobody remembers them because they were unmemorable they did not leave a mark on literary history but at the end of the 19th century hg wells's the war of the worlds certainly did this is the book that sets the template for just about every alien invasion narrative that gets uh, done either in film or in book or in comic book in the 20th century, uh, right up to the, 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 the movie Independence Day. Independence Day follows the narrative of the War of the Worlds. And in a way, it's, it's almost um, an unannounced adaptation of uh, the original The War of the Worlds, where there's a Martian invasion. But uh, Blaylock is simply 
referencing it. We get this intertextual reference that gets us thinking, perhaps if we know H.G. Wells, this is the thing about intertextuality is that it, it only really works well if you know the other works. Um, but we regularly have experiences of intertextuality within whatever genre we love. We'll be, you know, seeing or hearing or reading references to other works prior, from prior uh, to the one that we're, we're, we're taking a look at. Um, Blaylock is a, uh, an American writer from California. He's won the uh, O. Henry Award, which is a prestigious literary award, although most of his writing uh, fits into the large umbrella of speculative literature. Um, he's, he's done some steampunk. He did a little bit of fantasy. He's done some supernatural horror, I think would be the best way to describe it. Um, but here he's not doing any of those things. Although on, on, uh, at the beginning of the story, it certainly seems like he is. Uh, so War of the Worlds by James Blaylock is the story of a couple. Now, somebody might start out by saying, well, wait a second, isn't it the story of an alien invasion? It's the story of a couple. It's, uh, this Ed and Lisa, and they're living in the Berkeley Hills in California, and they have issues. <laughs> they have all sorts of relationship issues. And what happens is that um, they think that the world is being invaded by, or at least the Berkeley Hills are being invaded by aliens. Um, and all of their neighbors are, are fleeing and there's an evacuation order and they begin packing their little escort, their car, and, and chaos ensues. And we want to consider, you know, War of the Worlds in contrast not only to Station Eleven. How can we learn something about, you know, instances of everyday apocalypse? But also Stephen King's The Stand. How are Ed and Lisa... How, how is Ed and Lisa's story the same as the one that we're seeing in The Stand? While we readily admit that Ed and Lisa's narrative is distinct, right? And, and you know, just because both stories talk about a couple packing up really fast to leave in the face of the end of the world. Uh, these are very, very different narratives. And we want to we want to pay attention to those differences because they make huge differences to us in understanding what's going on. Uh, last lecture, I talked about the Joycean epiphany. I talked about James Joyce's epiphany. And uh, we want to revisit that. I want to make sure that you understand what an epiphany is when we're talking about epiphanies and short stories. James Joyce coined the term according to Ilsa Cox in Writing Short Stories, a book called Writing Short Stories, Joyce coined the term epiphany to describe a moment of intense insight which briefly illuminates the whole of existence, but the effect is implied, it is not made explicit. That, that is to say, um, there's no moment where, you know, someone comes out like at the end of the old Care Bears cartoons or the G.I. Joe cartoons from the 1980s where there was a moral to the story and someone would come out and make sure that you absolutely knew what the moral was. Um, Joycey and Epiphany is similar, but the effect is usually implied. There are instances where the characters are completely unaware of the epiphany that the reader may be having. So there's, there's no moment where the character goes, aha, uh, but the reader goes, oh, right? We get both in, uh, in Blaylock's War of the Worlds. Um, Valerie Shaw, in the short story, A Critical Introduction, says that every story should provide the key to its own elucidation. What does she mean by that? Every story should provide the key to solving its own puzzles. Even if... The solution consists of an aura of suggestiveness which actually expresses the elusiveness of certainties or the instability of human perceptions. What does she mean by that last part? If the point of the story is that life is meaningless, then the text, the film, whatever it may be, may feel meaningless. So if you're like, this is just chaos, life is chaos. That might be the epiphany you're supposed to be coming away from a particular work of literature with. And many of us don't like that. You know, we don't, we, we want our stories to be neat and tidy and we want happy endings. And if a, if a filmmaker gives us a really sad one, then we're like, I don't, I don't like that. Right. But that doesn't mean it was a bad film or a bad novel. It means that 
we just didn't like the epiphany that we were given. Uh, when we unlocked the key to the puzzle of that particular narrative, we were not happy with what we found. So you want to keep that in mind. The word epiphany, which is about this moment of illumination, this moment of aha, and that the story, whatever it may be, the narrative, whatever it may be, should provide the key to its own solution. And if it doesn't, that may be an indication that the narrative is about meaninglessness, the elusiveness of certainties, the instability of human perceptions. <gasps> but it might just also be that they sucked. So we, we, can't, we can't ignore the possibility that a writer can you know, do a really bad job of their work and we come away from it going, I don't know what that was supposed to mean. And we're doing that because they did a bad job should never, never think that we can never, you know, you know, in a literature course, we can still say, eh, I don't think it's very good. Um, but that's distinct. That's distinct from, I didn't like it. Let's make sure that we understand that there is a huge gulf between those things. Far too often, students will say, eh, it just didn't work for me. Like I should care. It just didn't work for you. Do you say that in calculus too? Eh, this, this formula just didn't work for me. Um, doesn't matter if it doesn't work for you. We can still look at it and say, I think this is really well made. I didn't enjoy it, but it's well made. And I understand what they were trying to do. They were trying to do X, Y, or Z. Um, we also want to we, we want to get a few more terms in our in our uh, in our bag of terms. Many of you know what a theme is, or at least you think you do from high school English. Um, in general, says the Broadview Pocket Glossary of Literary Terms, a theme is an idea explored in a work through character, action, and or image. Through character, action, and or image. And that last one is encompassing because there are images of characters and images of action, right? To be fully developed, however, a theme must consist of more than a single concept or idea. It should also include an argument about the idea. Thus, if a poem examines the topic of jealousy, we might say that the theme is that jealousy undermines love or that jealousy is a manifestation of insecurity. Okay. So it shouldn't just be jealousy or war or the apocalypse, for example, right? We don't just say that the theme of station 11 is the apocalypse because we know that's not true. The theme of station 11 is likely survival is insufficient. But how do we arrive at that? So you might know what the theme is and take that, that idea of any mathematical problem and they say, show your work. They don't want to just know that you know the answer. They want you to show them how you got there so that you can demonstrate that you understand why that's the answer. So how do we get to a theme? And remember that theme is distinct from what we talked about in other lectures about the single effect. Poe's idea of the unity of effect is about emotional effect not theme. So we can feel fear or we can feel suspense or we can feel love or we can feel frustration, which is what a lot of my students do. That's the single effect that a lot of students speak about. When I say, what do you think the single effect is uh, of Blaylock's War of the Worlds? Many of my students are like, frustration. And I'm like, why? Because of the way they act through the whole story as they're carting stuff out of their house and fighting and bickering with each other. Um, so we might, you know, we would, we would say for sure that, you know, one of the themes of War of the Worlds is conflict, love, conflict in love. But how, you know, through what, what other themes, you know, are, are being explored there? Well, to arrive at a theme, we have to know something about motifs, an idea, an image, an action or plot element that recurs throughout a literary work. So we want to look for, for repetitions. Motifs are ideas, images, actions, or plot elements that recur throughout a literary, literary work. And that's why I, I have us looking at Everyday Apocalypse, so that we can see one of the motifs of Mandel's Station Eleven over and over again. This motif of Everyday Apocalypse. And what that does, according to the Broadview Pocket Glossary of Literary Terms, is it creates new levels of meaning and strengthens structural coherence. We can find 
themes based on motifs. Now you'll 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 remember that they said that it was character, action, and or image. But motifs, idea, image, action, or plot element, there's there's serious crossover there. Um, so we we look for motifs, these repetitions, to understand the theme of a work. And then we measure that against what the effect was on us in the first place. And if there is a huge dissonance between the theme and motifs that we've been looking at and our reaction, then one of those things is borked. One of those things needs to be re-examined. The term motif is taken from music where it describes recurring melodies or themes. So again, we're, we're seeing some uh, overlap of, of terminology, but really motifs are a way of arriving at theme. We look for those repetitions. So what do we get from motif in War of the Worlds? Is it the broken heart? No, it's a bowling ball. And we don't just get this bowling ball once. We get it many times. And not just as bowling ball, but if you were paying attention, you might note that the shape of the supposed alien craft is a great big black sphere. So Blaylock is intentionally reusing the motif of this sphere of darkness <laughs> uh, throughout the throughout War of the Worlds to communicate something about what's going on. So we've got this great big looming threat of a black sphere, while at the same time we have a very small looming threat of a black sphere. And that lo small looming threat comes from uh, this moment where Ed is, is recalling when he bought this bowling ball in the first place. Ed and Lisa don't have a lot of money. And there's a child coming. There's a baby on the way. And he goes and he spends over $400 on a bowling ball uh, as, a, as, a, as a whimsical spur-of-the-moment purchase. Impulse buy. And Lisa is, we can probably all say, rightly angry about that purchase. But we wouldn't want to jump all the way to saying that that makes Lisa right for the rest of the story. Because there's a sort of back and forth going on here. We really only have Ed's point of view, but it sure reveals a lot. That's one of the things I love about Blaylock's uh, writing here is that even though we're only getting Ed as the focalizer of this story we sure learn a ton about Lisa and even how Lisa sees Ed and really the things that Ed doesn't even see about himself. There, Blaylock reveals uh, Ed's weaknesses while Ed is unaware of them. But we as the reader are aware of them. We have some minor epiphanies, we might say, about that. I'm going to read you a section of War of the Worlds to give you a sense of Ed and his voice as as rendered by Blaylock, and where we can see Blaylock going, Ed's got some issues, even though he's our focalizer. Uh, a somewhat goofy, um, what would we say, uh, hoarder, <laughs> um, as he begins to pack for the apocalypse. So this is after the, the evacuation notice has been spelled out. He's given a box to Lisa to go and start packing some stuff. Uh, you might remember what gets packed for the apocalypse from any discussion that you've ever had with friends or as we've done in our class. Uh, what would you what would you grab if you had 30 minutes or from looking at the stand or from Jeevan's experience in Station Eleven? And let's contrast that with Ed's in War of the Worlds. Here we go. He looked around the garage with an inquisitive eye. He couldn't be excessive. The escort wasn't roomy enough for excess. The boxes containing the train set lay against the back wall, but there wasn't a single one of them that would even fit in the escort, even if he bungeed the tr trunk lid down. They'd need to be sorted and repacked, and there wasn't time for that. My kingdom for a U-Haul truck, he thought, turning his back on the trains. The world is ending, and this guy's thinking about his HO train set. Lying on the bench was the matched set of deer antlers his Uncle Oscar had given him 20-odd years ago. They were mounted on a mahogany plaque with a tooled leather patch that had his name on it, Oscar. His favorite uncle was dead now, which was reason enough not to abandon the antlers to the aliens. It dawned on him that the horns formed a cage the size of a large basket, into which he could load all manner of things so that they wouldn't really consume excess space anyway. The bowling bag sat on the bench too, but he ignored it for the moment and went out into the night carrying the antlers, hurrying down to the car where he put them in the trunk. 
Then he fetched the box full of clothing from the back seat and repacked the travel kit and odds and ends of clothing within the arched confines of the horns. So he's taken this object that gives him nostalgia for a, a, a late Uncle Oscar. And he makes it one of the things that he's bringing along with him. And I want us to just imagine that if it was a film. Think about that concept of mise-en-scene. Everything that's in the frame. And if what the filmmaker chooses to have a character packing in a shot of a film where they think the world is about to end is deer antlers, that's a ludicrous image. So when we think about motifs, ideas, images, actions, or plot elements that recur throughout a literary work, we need to consider the antlers because they come up several times. And they're a ludicrous image. Who packs deer antlers in the face of the apocalypse? Now, you as the reader might feel frustrated. Dude, what's wrong with you? But picture it. Then picture what happens next, which is, you know, him going and getting a bunch of records, LPs. Uh, he's just going to keep getting all the bric-a-brac from his garage that reminds him of his past, his life. Maybe his single life, his life without Lisa. But what does Lisa bring to the table? A cage full of parakeets. Who brings parakeets to the apocalypse? Photo albums. Many of my students say that one of the things that they would take with them if they only had 30 minutes to go into the apocalypse is photo albums. So we can relate to Lisa, but we can also readily attest that those are not particularly practical objects. So really, neither of them is bringing anything logical to the table. They keep bringing things that are tangible, but have all sorts of intangible associations to the past, to what matters to them. And they can't see why the other things matter to the other person. So then imagine what happens once they start coming back and forth to the escort, looking inside, seeing the crap that the other person has put in there, picking it up and chucking it on the lawn. Now, initially, Ed only places things on the lawn, but there comes a point where they're just hoisting them out onto the lawn. It has the hallmarks of a sort of dark comedy. There's, there is a comedic vision here. It's not a full on ha ha comedy, but it is a chuckle comedy that ends somewhat tragically. Ed and Lisa have problems. Blaylock doesn't just tell us this. He shows us this through motif after motif that reinforces the difficulty of the relationship. And one of the recurring motifs is the antlers. One of the recurring motifs is that cage with birds in it. One of the recurring motifs is the bowling ball. And the point at which Lisa just gets fed up with this process entirely, takes the bowling ball and chucks it down the road, is the moment where we've probably reached the final straw. And then they both pile into the car to drive away. But this is a conflict between two people more than it is a story about an alien invasion. The alien invasion is the setting, if it's anything. It's Ed and Lisa's conflict that's really what this story is ultimately about. And we get this great moment of epiphany, and it's spelled out for us. It's not something that we have to go digging too deeply for. But Ed and Lisa start driving away, and then along comes the uh, police off, uh, the fireman fireman comes up and says you folks can go home excitement's over sorry for the panic it's over ed asked what the hell was it all that for nothing he thought but then he glanced over at lisa and realized that it hadn't been for nothing he wasn't that lucky it might be the end of the world one way or another it might be the end of the world one way or another. There's the everyday apocalypse right there. Has the world of Berkeley Hills, California ended? Have the aliens really invaded and they're destroying major landmarks with their heat rays? No. It's just Ed's little world that's ending. It might be the end of the world one way or another. The aliens had won without firing a shot. So... It turns out that it's uh, some performance artists who were doing some stuff out in the woods. And everybody mistook it for an alien invasion. Because it's October 30th, which was the same date that um, Orson Welles 
broadcast an Americanized version over the radio of H.G. Wells's story. Lots of Wells's, too many Wells's. Uh, but Orson Wells famously did this radio broadcast and Amer- apparently started a panic, although it's the panic was not near as extensive as many reports have had us believe for a very long time. It used to sound like all of America mobilized. It wasn't like that. Um, but there's that reference again. There's that intertextual reference to the alien invasion part of the story, which is re- really isn't what this story is about. The story isn't about an alien invasion. The apocalypse is a backdrop for a domestic squabble between a couple who are already having problems. And this simply brings everything to a head. And the motif of the, the bowling ball is this recurring image that communicates the dissonance in their relationship without just saying, they're having problems. I mean, he does say that at one point, but then he reinforces it over and over again and shows us the problems So as, as the structure, the very structure of the story, of the narrative. So now let's move to I Prefer You with a Crown and think about the instances of everyday apocalypse that we find in that narrative. Remember that this starts out with Arthur Leander's point of view, that he is our focalizer at the beginning of I Prefer You with a Crown. Incidentally, Emily St. John Mandel has said that one of the um, concepts that she was working on, which became Station Eleven, was a novel about an actor's life. It's Arthur Leander's story. So what we're seeing here is uh, the parts of the novel that she might have written that would have just been about Arthur Leander but has been woven into the fabric of this, I think, much richer novel that has all these different perspectives. Again, though, why why Station Eleven for a title if this is, you know, a story about an actor? Uh, why, Why is that the encompassing concept that we carry with us, whether we realize it or not, right? Um, But Arthur Leander talking about his experience on Delano Island. It must have been so beautiful, people say, when he says what his life was like on that island off the coast of British Columbia, somewhere out near um, Vancouver Island. It was, he tells them. And then he says, it is. And right there we have a little bit of that everyday apocalypse Arthur's life on the island ended and his life in Toronto began, right? So we get, we get the endings and we get the beginnings. And that's a repetition of that other concept that we've been working with of terminal language, that things end certainly, and then they begin again, that there's a moving on from one stage to another. And I want to remind us of the idea of story places versus narrative space. Denman Island is a real place. And that is where Emily St. John Mandel lived for a good chunk of her life. So Delano Island is based on Denman Island. We have a story place, a real place, but Delano Island is a narrative space. And it's being used particularly in this book for very, very particular reasons. I can imagine that maybe some of the people from Denman Island are like, I don't like the way that she represented us in that book. She's not actually talking about you. I mean, maybe she is, but she's not really, because this is a work of fiction. Delano Island is as fictional as the Borgo Pass in Dracula, or Hogwarts for that matter. You might say, that seems like a bit of a stretch. They can do magic at Hogwarts. Yeah, but fiction is fiction. Delano Island doesn't really exist on planet Earth as we know it, but it does in Station Eleven. You want to talk about magic? Creating an entire island all by yourself. Uh, And it's this place that she thought of as a sort of a dead-end space. Um, Or that, I shouldn't say that. It's the... (laughs) Arthur thought it was a dead end. And he he shares that, you know, where you came from, with Miranda, this young woman who is working in an office space when we first meet her. Um, she had dreams of you know being an artist, but she she's shacked up with this loser, Pablo, uh, this serious loser who uh, is not good to her and is super bad to her when things start to go south for them as a couple. And we meet her. Miranda at 17. That's what the book says. Miranda at 17. That's a different Miranda 
from the one that we met in the theater, who is described as being on the south coast of Malaysia. So we have different Mirandas. We have Miranda at 17. We have Miranda on the south coast of Malaysia. We have Miranda three years later in I Prefer You With a Crown. And these are all Mirandas who have gone through various forms of everyday apocalypse. Miranda's first everyday apocalypse is with Pablo, leaving Pablo, getting out of a bad relationship. Um, and the way that, that Mandel writes this stuff has that sense of the apocalyptic. She could call in sick to work, pack up her things, and be gone in a few hours. It is sometimes necessary to break everything. You break everything, that's apocalyptic, right? The breaking of everything is an apocalypse. This is an emotional apocalypse. This is a small A apocalypse, an everyday apocalypse. I could throw everything, I could throw away almost everything, she thinks, and begin all over again. Incidentally, I keep saying incidentally today. Oh, well, when I was a kid, my parents played the uh, story of Noah's Ark, among other Bible stories, when I was going to sleep. And uh, that, that's the phrase that was used in that children's book, that God would start all over again after the flood. He'd start all over again. It's the, the language of the apocalypse. Tear it all down. Start all over again. And here's Mandel inserting this language into the chapter where there's no sign of what we would normally think of as apocalypse. But I Prefer You With a Crown still fits there. I, I remember when I first read the novel going, hmm, interesting section of the book. We've got what? The apocalypse, the post-apocalypse. This is clearly the pre-apocalypse. But then as I did this closer investigation, fine-tooth combing the language, what we call close reading in the uh, Department of English, close reading, picking up on these instances of everyday apocalypse over and over again. And then, and then she gets together with Arthur and they move to Los Angeles. Yay, everything's great, right? No, because Arthur can't stay in a relationship. He's not great that way. Uh, we sympathize with him. We like him, but he's not great with relationships. He'd been great for the, the tabloids, right? That's where uh, Kirsten ends up looking for him in the, in the, in the remains of civilization in the post-apocalypse. Uh, but the language of Miranda in Los Angeles, this is a different Miranda now from Miranda at 17 or even Miranda in Toronto. This is Miranda in LA. This is not Mar Miranda in Malaysia. This is Miranda in LA. It's too late and it's been too late for a while, is what she realizes about her relationship with Arthur. There's nothing to be gained by watching the shipwreck. I mean, just think about the name that we use most often for this. They're breaking up. Something's being destroyed. Something has reached catastrophe level. Uh, some other quotes from the book. This life was never ours. We were only ever borrowing it. That's terminal language now. This is still part of the everyday apocalypse, but we've got that terminal language where it ends, but it's not the end, capital, all capital letters, right? She's always found this house beautiful, but it's even more so now that she's leaving, right? That sense of moving on and exiting in the next version of her life now that Los Angeles is over. But I love in the next version of her life because it's Mandel going, no, it's not the end of the world. It's the end of a world. Because even if we go back to the section from the theater where she's doing the incomplete list, right? Um, that's the world of electricity. Uh, at the beginning of Midsummer Night's Dream, 20 years after the end of air travel. She doesn't say 20 years after the end of the world. She says 20 years after the end of air travel. This is... An apocalypse. Station 11 is filled with apocalypses. One is huge and many are small. And I think that that's, that's a big part of the theme of this book. That things can end, but it's not an ending to everything. Now, this isn't something that um, any of the, the um, sources that we're using this term uh, talk about, at least none that I can recall. Uh, this idea of everyday apocalypse, 
might just be mine. Um, I've not seen anyone else talk about it. I can't be the only person to have picked up on it, but I, I just haven't read anybody else talking about it. That makes me excited because that's that whole process of like, as we read, looking for some new opening to be able to write about it or to talk about it. And I want to make sure that those of you who are my students know that you can run with this ball when it comes time to in our course. So be watching for the language of the everyday apocalypse, the moments of the everyday apocalypse, because they will be fair game for the research paper near the end of the course. For everyone else who's listening, I just want you to keep thinking about that as you're reading Station Eleven and contemplating that use of everyday apocalypse. Now, would we always call a breakup in a short story or a novel or a movie a moment of everyday apocalypse? I suppose we could, but I'm really highlighting it here because this novel is about uh, the apocalypse or an apocalypse, capital A apocalypse. So I don't want to say that every breakup in every narrative ever is an instance of everyday apocalypse. But I think that when you um, pair the idea of a breakup with apocalyptic imagery, like aliens invading, well then you've probably got what we're talking about here with everyday apocalypse. It's the time that, that, that someone's little world comes to an end. Next week, we're going to look less at Station Eleven and a lot more at Calvin and Hobbes. So as we move into the section of the book called The Starship... We'll still, we'll still have a, a few moments to talk about some of these things, talk about uh, the way in which motifs are utilized, themes are utilized, and how uh, the language of survival is, uh, is uh, insufficient, because that's a, that's a theme, and wh where do we see it reinforced over and over again through motifs, uh, is used in the section of the book called Starship. But I want to take a look at how to read comics, because contrary to what regular comic books readers might assume if you stop reading comics as a kid and then you come back to read them as an adult it's not as intuitive as you'd think to do so to to be able to read it and parse it and understand what it's doing and because we're going to be looking at uh the walking dead somewhere down the road we need to know how to read comics so that we'll be able to read them well so next time on triple bladed sword i'm going to be teaching you uh, how to uh, read comics. And for those of you who are watching this on YouTube and you're like, Triple Bladed Sword, whatever are you talking about? That's the name of my podcast. So if you ever want to check this out, it's just the podcast because you can't make it here to the YouTube channel to check it out here. Uh, that's where you want to go. But as I say, Calvin and Hobbes, Spaceman Spiff, intertextuality of a cosmic nature next time on Triple Bladed Sword. <laughs>